Hello and welcome to Sear Week Conversations presented by S&P Global. My name is Jim Burkhardt and I'm joined by three of our top researchers and thought leaders, uh, Bushin Bari, Kurt Barrow and Matt Sagers. And today we're going to tackle the question about investment in oil. Is the peak in investment behind us? Have we already seen it? Or is it ahead of us? The historical peak of spending uh, for capital expenditures for oil and gas was in 2014, when uh, almost $800 million were spent on CapEx when you add in- Billion, Jim, billion. Billion, sorry, <laughs> thank you, Matt. It's almost 800 billion. <laughs> and then when you add in uh, 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 spending on uh, operations, it was well over a trillion dollars. Now, since that time, uh, spending has not come anywhere close to that. We had the oil price collapse that began in 2014. Uh, we had COVID, and there was a time when uh, spending fell to just half the level, less than half the level that it was in 2014. Now, it's come up a bit in 2021 and 2022, but it still remains well below what it was. And in terms of the downstream, oil refining specifically, global refining capacity fell a bit in 2020 and 2021. So we're going to uh, discuss uh, global refining investment, but let's start with upstream investment and let's talk uh, about the Middle East first. Uh, Bushin, uh, what is your take on how uh, the major Gulf producers view the energy transition and spending? Uh, thanks, Jim, and uh, hello, everybody. Uh, yeah, the, I, I, I suppose by uh, middle, major Middle East producers, we're focusing primarily on Saudi Arabia and the UAE, although Kuwait and Iraq, and possibly at some later stage, Iran will also come in. Uh, the issue for them is the uncertainty of demand going into the future. And that uncertainty relates to the speed of transition and how the other oil producers will react. Yes, they have low cost oil, but that alone does not solve their problem if there's no demand for it. So the process that's going on in these countries now is to diverse, diversify the economies and the investments needed for that are going to borrow from oil. And there's a good reason for that because they're beginning to behave like oil companies, international oil companies in terms of oil investments, which is the return on that investment relative to what else they need to do. So I think they're being very cautious. And a case in point is a recent statement by the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia saying they will go up to 13 million, which is about a million more than they are now by 2027. And beyond that, nothing, that's it. That's the limit. Now they might change their mind, they might do something different, but they're not going to invest a lot of money without seeing the return. That also has to do with maintaining spare capacity. I think they're not really willing anymore to maintain large volumes of oil held spare for the world. They'd rather monetize it as best as they can. So I think those things combine together to say, yes, there'll be a lot of Middle Eastern oil coming, but we should not expect sort of huge amounts because they're going to be competing within the domestic investment environment. So yes. Uh, Bushin, let's uh, just explore the spare capacity issue uh, for another moment. So spare capacities for, for many, many years, it was a matter of policy yep. uh, in Saudi Arabia to maintain spare capacity at 1.5 to 2 million barrels per day. Has that perspective changed? Yes. That has changed, and we noticed that in public statements, they no longer refer to it explicitly. They say we will provide more oil, but they do not say we're keeping a million and a half and two in spare. In other words, their production has been rising this year, and in fact, last year as well, and they're about 11 million barrels. They just have, theoretically, just about a million more left, but they're not increasing spare capacity by investing more right now. They're waiting till 20, you know, the next lot will come in 2027. So no great investments mm -hmm. announced, even though their production is now roughly say a million more than it used to be. Matt, uh, let's talk about Russia. Obviously the invasion of Ukraine has changed Russia, changed the world. Uh, what's your outlook on the trajectory of Russian production, not just in the months ahead, but in the years ahead? <laughs> 
Well, Jim, they've been producing, as we look over the past few years, at say 10, 11 million barrels a day. That's been the general range that they've been in. Uh, and unlike a lot of the other places where uh, investment collapsed uh, after 2014, uh, Russia and the Russian companies continue to invest through those downturns to sort of maintain that kind of production capacity. So their problem right now, of course, is where are they going to find the market? But I think the overall picture here longer term is that investment is going to remain relatively high as much as can be managed uh, by the companies. But at the same time, this is very clearly going to be a diminishing sort of resource. I think Russia is still going to remain a major producer. But on the other hand, uh, the kind of money that they can bring, uh, particularly without international technologies and companies, is probably mean that their overall production is going to continue to run down from where it is. And it's kind of a question of pace rather than kind of overall direction. But still, think of them as a major world producer, just not in the same range as the U.S. or Saudi Arabia, at, you know, 10-11. Matt, before the invasion, uh, the growth prospects for Russian production uh, offshore Arctic, perhaps more challenging terrain, terrains than we've typically seen, say, in West Siberia. Do the, uh, this deintegration between the Western world and Russia impact the viability of that or the, the, the attractiveness of those um, uh, uh, other areas? I think that it definitely is lower their attractiveness and their ability to sort of fit those areas of the oil patch within this, this window of kind of what is possible for the Russian domestic technology and kind of what the costs are of this sort of stuff. They've traditionally left a lot of these more difficult bits to the international majors and, and uh, you know, joint ventures and so forth. And those are, you know, that's out of the question now. The companies are pulling out and, and are moving on. Same thing with the service companies. So therefore, it's got to fit within this range of what the domestic industry can do, uh, that overall cost you know, framework that they've got. And that means that a lot of this stuff, although it's still viable as such, it's, it's outside of that window. So I think that their overall, let's say, prospects are diminished as well. Uh, Kurt, let's talk about the downstream. Now, the upstream is about resource extraction. Downstream is about uh, manufacturing. Have we seen the peak in downstream investment or is the picture more complicated than that? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, Jim. It's a little more nuanced uh, kind of, you know, by region, right? So, you know, what, what we saw happen um, during the downturn with COVID was we, we did shut a substantial chunk of capacity, something like 4 million barrels a day at, uh, out of 100 million barrels a day. And that really created this, this um, extreme tightness that we saw as demand, you know, came uh, kind of came roaring back. And that's why we saw the very high crack spreads and the very high refining profitability. Um, you know, as we look forward, um, the majority of all the investments are in the east, you know, where, where a lot of the demand growth is, about 70% or so of the CapEx spend over the next five years is is in the east, um, you know, 20 to 25% of that in India and China each. Um, so, you know, we're seeing, um, you know, the rationalization and the, uh, the, the uh, maybe the hardening of some of the, the strong assets in the West and, and shutting down the, uh, the weaker assets as we expand in, in the East. But underlying all this is, is that demand uncertainty that, that Bouchon uh, referred to. That's affecting the downstream, you know, as it's affecting the upstream. Kurt, could you uh, talk a little bit about crude chemicals? First, explain what it is and then help us understand if that is a area of investment or investment growth. Sure. Yeah. So, so the term crude to chemicals is a broad category um, that, that includes um, a couple different things, right? It includes the, the concept of shifting more of the output from a refinery from the fuels market, where, you know, a lot of the traditional business has been in essentially refining oil into transportation fuel and uh, other products, they've always sent, um, you know, a portion of that output, you know, into chemicals. Uh, but the the demand uh, trends of those two markets are are dramatically different in, in in the future, right? Where we have this fuels trend that is flattening at best, probably declining, uh, you know, at some point in the future, 
you know, uh, as opposed to the petrochemical demand that we think continues to grow, even in uh, even as you bring more circular economy uh, into the petrochemical sector. The other uh, concept of petrochemicals is a technology play where you can uh, change the kit uh, in the refining and petchem complex to uh, use some new technology, some new scale uh, to put more uh, of the output. Uh, so some of the new plants that are starting up in China or, or operating in China now have over half of their output, uh, you know, from a sizable refinery into petrochemicals. So, you know, the move into petrochemicals is a strategy that some downstream players are, are using for uh, to, to future proof their business. Biofuels is, is another play. And. You know, there's uh, there's an interest really around the broader energy transition. There's an interest from the downstream companies to participate and to to produce new lower carbon fuels. Uh, and you see that in the advanced biofuels, uh, renewable diesel. Um, and it, you'll see more of it going forward, we think, in, in some of the hydrogen integration, some of the uh, synthetic uh, e-fuels. Uh, but... We really need some uh, some policy clarity before uh, before some of those moves happen. And Kurt, as is you uh, mentioned, investment in some parts of the world is going up, others less so. Uh, refining capacity in the U.S. has gotten a lot of attention uh, in the last few months, and some refineries have uh, they may not be processing crude oil any, crude oil anymore. They may be devoted to something else. But could you talk a little bit about kind of what you're seeing in terms of the changing composition of U.S. downstream? Yeah, so, um, you know, what we've seen, right, is, is during the downturn in COVID, uh, a couple things happened, right? So one, you know, we saw a, a real uh, uh, impetus on the, on the net zero, kind of a, kind of a, 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 a doubling down or a, a commitment to uh, climate strategy, right? And so what you saw was some of the weaker assets, and this is true in the U.S. and Europe as well, some of the weaker assets were uh, taken out of crude oil service, really, and those, some of that equipment repurposed to process uh, uh, other feedstocks uh, into uh, lower carbon, you know, renewable diesel, say, for example, renewable jet. Um, we saw some assets uh, that were just closed because of poor economics. We saw uh, a couple assets that were damaged, you know, in, in some way in, in storm or a fire, and uh, the owner decided just, you know, not, not to reinvest. Um, at the same time, you're seeing, you know, the offshore uh, opportunities for, for exporting products into, uh, into Latin America and Africa, some of the uh, emerging markets continues to expand. So you're seeing other refineries, uh, you know, look for those opportunities you know, we'll continue to see some, uh, uh, you know, expansion of the industry, even though we won't necessarily see, you know, quote unquote, new, uh, you know, new greenfield refining sites. Matt, we talked about the Russian upstream. What's What about the future of the Russian downstream? It's a significant industry itself. And they export a very significant amount. And this has been kind of one of the unknowns here as we sort through this, uh, this post-sanction environment here. But the, uh, the trends that we've seen have been very similar to what Kurt has been talking about. The weak assets, the ones that are basically not much more than pipe stills, produce a lot of heavy resid, they've been the ones that have been most challenged. And so as we look at the first half of this year, their production, their throughput, their operation has dropped quite dramatically. And the more sophisticated refineries have gone on ahead. In other words, they've been able to find markets by, by hook or by crook for gasoline and diesel, but it's been very difficult, much more difficult to get rid of the heavy resids that like, for example, found homes in the more sophisticated refineries in the United States and in Europe that are now essentially closed off. So I think that the picture for Russia's downstream is one of rationalization. Uh, you, you just simply can't export 
products from from refineries that are 2000 kilometers deep in the interior when you're competing with a lot of coastal refineries that can ship products sort of here and there so there's a lot of rationalization that's got to take place uh upgrading the refineries are, as a whole are still not very sophisticated and i think that's going to be a very difficult prolonged process but i still think that russian product exports are going to find uh, niches in the world market. It's just simply going to be here and there and not nearly as concentrated in Europe as it was. So do you see a reorientation of uh, Russian crude and product exports? Uh, we've definitely seen a reorientation of crude exports uh, in the first half of this year. Uh, crude exports have actually increased uh, over time, uh, which a lot of people didn't think would happen. And there's been a very strong eastward orientation that's happened. Uh, India has now emerged as a, you know, a big time buyer, over a million barrels a day, when it wasn't before. And this is basically a switch from Europe to, uh, to Asia. For refined products, it's a much more difficult process than that. Uh, and so the result is, I think that, that the refineries are probably going to feel a much greater contraction or, or impetus for that, uh, because it's going to be much more difficult for them to refine, pro to, to find markets for all those diverse products that come out crude, much more generic product. There's a lot of, you know, pent up demand, if you want to think of that in a lot of refineries. So I think that's going to be a, a real differentiator. But again, we'll have to wait and see. It's a lot easier to hide the origin of uh, refined products than it, than it is, uh, you know, that very unique signature for, for crude oil. So we'll just simply have to watch to see what happens in the second half. And since we're talking about oil investment, uh, we'd be remiss if we didn't talk about the United States. Uh, which is still the largest crude oil producer in the world, producing less than it did in 2019 on the eve of COVID. But uh, let's I'll shed a little bit of light on our thoughts on, on uh, the U.S. specifically. So if you look back 2010 to 2020, the U.S. Uh, led the world in crude oil production growth. It really changed the world oil order. Uh, you could say it played a role in um, spawning uh, OPEC+. Plus. But during that decade, the U.S. industry... Uh, burned through about $250 billion, billion with a B, billion dollars uh, that uh, decade. And when you look at the stock market performance during that decade of all the major sectors in the S&P 500 index, uh, energy, which is essentially oil and gas, uh, had the lowest equity, equity returns by far. Uh, when you look at technology, a number of other sectors were far higher. So it was a decade where uh, a lot of cash uh, was spent and the returns were poor. Then you had COVID. Uh, oil demand fell 20% in one month in April 2020. Then you had these net zero aspirations emerge uh, right after COVID from China in particular. And then the U.S. elected Joe Biden. He put forward a net zero aspiration for the United States. So when you look at the capital discipline story in the U.S. upstream right now, uh, you can see why it uh, is so strong right now. A decade of growth, but poor returns, and now greater uncertainty about the future of oil demand. So while we think U.S. oil production is going to grow, uh, it's not likely to repeat uh, the volume growth we saw for so many years uh, during the last decade. We could see significant growth next year, uh, but capital discipline is real. And it is something that uh, you have to take into account uh, when looking at the future of uh, global oil uh, production. Uh, Bushin, last question for you. This isn't strictly about investment, but it's about the oil market. And it's about a, a force uh, that can influence uh, the trajectory of prices. Uh, and that is OPEC plus and Bushin, how do you think about the future of OPEC plus in a post uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine world? That's a, that's a great question, Jim. So speculating a bit, looking forward, we have um, so far the leaders of OPEC, and by that I mean primarily Saudi Arabia, but also along with help from the other Gulf producers that are allies of Saudi Arabia have held firm uh, by not intervening in ways that may look like anything that could break apart that alliance. It's very important to them to have Russia inside. 
And I think so far they've resisted all attempts even to say something which would which would upset that balance. So they hold that in high regards. Likewise, uh, the Russians have been very careful about their dealings with the leaders of OPEC and they've kept in close touch on the phone, uh, sending their foreign minister there uh, to talk uh, at reasonable intervals just to keep everything uh, going as it was. In the sense, like when President Biden went to Saudi Arabia recently, uh, so did just before that the Russian foreign minister, and and then you know um, Putin and uh, and uh, and the Crown Prince have been talking regularly on the phone. So I think that that alliance has proved to be durable for the moment under the stress. Will it be so going forward? Yes, there's a little tension. I think Matt referred to that just now that the Russian oil is moving east, which are the traditional markets, the growth markets and premium markets for the Middle East oil because it charged more for the Middle East uh, for oil in Asia. And the Middle East will to some extent seek to replace the oil that Europe needs and does not want, want to buy from Russia anymore. So there's some change in patterns, but none of that has resulted in a, a disruption of these relations. What could cause a, cause a problem? That's when the competition or market share intensifies where one of them has to lose, let's say Saudi Arabia versus Russia. That may be a time when there may have to be a political adjustment but for the moment, uh, OPEC plus is simply Saudi Arabia and Russia and then their ally allies and other members of their groups. Uh, and that so far does not look like weakening in the immediate future. After the transition takes off more, uh, more rapidly and we start losing demand, we don't know how they'll square that. Uh, one reason why the Middle East may not be interested in expanding capacity, and I don't know, Russia perhaps will have the same problem, is they would rather maintain the status quo here, the volume of oil, and get more and more price, a uh, higher price for it, rather than compete to sell more oil into a, a sort of um, a market which doesn't need as much. So I think that's that's the situation. Let me let me ask a question about kind of when you talked about the political adjustments. My mind immediately turned to Barkindo. Uh, when I think about OPEC Plus, I just have a very hard time not visualizing you know his presence. Uh, and it seemed to me like he did play a role uh, when he was general director of OPEC in providing that that kind of political adjustment that was going yes. on there when it was tough. And do you see um, anything different or, or did we already sort of see this already with Barkindo's departure? And I, I mean that both in a, uh, a real sense yes. and, then, and then also in a figurative sense where his, his time at OPEC was done. But uh, do you think that the, the leadership <clears throat> and the adjustment there is, is going to be able to carry out the same kind of political adjustment with the aplomb that uh, Barkindo brought to it. So Matt, you raised an excellent point here. The two sides to this thing. One is Barkindo, uh, of course, um, was a diplomat, uh, you know, really very, very smooth, made, made things possible uh, at the secretariat level and so forth. But he did not negotiate the agreements. The agreement really happened between Putin and the crown prince in China in 2016. That was, that was the foundation of it. Uh, after that, Barkindo helped um, make it possible and made it run smoothly for a while till they, they had their own differences. Well, let's uh, wrap things up here. And to do that, uh, for those of you who like numbers, I'm going to uh, uh, share a couple numbers because after all, the, uh, the root of this conversation is about investment and oil prices, but some numbers. As I mentioned at the beginning, uh, the peak in upstream capital spending was in 2014 when uh, just about $800 billion uh, was spent. Uh, by 2020, that was cut in half uh, less than half, actually, and it has started to go up. And this year, 
2022, we expect upstream CapEx to be about $573 billion. Now you look at those two numbers, you say, well, it's still well under 2014. Yes, it is. But keep in mind, the cost structure of oil has also fallen. The cost structure in 2014 was higher than it is now. So each CapEx dollar today uh, can go a little bit further than it did in uh, 2014. Now, will CapEx continue to rise? Well, the most important barometer uh, for seeing if capital spending is going to rise or not is the oil price. If the oil price goes up, that tends to support oil price, uh, higher spending. When the oil price goes down, that tends to lead to uh, lower spending. We think that relationship is uh, still in place. And while we may not see the 2014 nominal peak hit uh, next year, uh, oil spending uh, is on the way or has been recovering and is going up this year and perhaps could be a bit higher next year. But thank you, uh, Bushin, Kurt, and Matt very much uh, for your thoughts. And thank you for joining us on Sir Week Conversations presented by S&P Global.